Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our blog from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we address your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. So as always, we have with us Dr. Anvita Madan Behel. Anvita is a psychosexual therapist and she brings to um, the questions a psychological and clinical perspective to add to the advice of the Kama Sutra. Welcome Anvita. Thank you Seema and welcome to our vlog this week. So Anvita, today we're going to talk about fetishes. You know, over the last few weeks, I've had a lot of emails about fetishes from men as well as women. And I found it quite interesting because the questions that have come in, the, each fetish is different, but it's much deeper than just the idea of the sexual preference that they're expressing. You know, their questions are about how these fetishes have impacted their life, about how it has impacted the way that they think. And most importantly, how it is impacting their relationships because we always think of a fetish as an individual thing it belongs to a person we forget that there is a partner involved and what happens if the partner is not into the same fetish so there's quite a lot of very interesting questions that have come in which i'm looking forward to discussing with you today interestingly also the one common denominator in all of these questions the last line of every message, every email has been, is this a sin? Am I doing something bad? Is something wrong with me? So I think today we're also looking forward to helping a lot of these people understand themselves and get over their own fears. But to begin with, a very simple question, and you might laugh at me, but you know, is there a difference between a fetish and a fantasy, because whenever we use the word fetish, somehow it has a sort of underground feel to it, something that should be hidden, something that shouldn't be talked about, almost negative, but fantasies are supposed to be fabulous. So is there a difference between the two? That's such an interesting question, actually. And, um, you know, we rarely think about it. But if we just take the word fantasy, fantasy is about imagination. You can fantasize about any and everything. It's in your thoughts. And, you know, it's mostly about sexual acts. So, you know, you imagine how and where you would have uh, perform a sexual act. And you can even imagine that it could be on the move, right? Like it could be anywhere. It's in your imagination. Whereas fetishes are more real. They are more concrete in some ways. They could be about body parts other than your genitals. So we've heard of the foot fetish very often, or they would be to do with objects like leather or rubber um, or, you know, something else. Um, wearing lingerie, like those could be the fetishes. But I think what's important there is that the person feels that the arousal or how much pleasure they will get if the fetish is involved will be that much higher with or without the fetish. And that's what makes it important. And that's why fetishes, you know, become important for people. Okay, so that's interesting. So what we're saying is that fantasies are an imagining, um, a personal imagining of the sexual act, but the fetish is arousal and involving something other than the sexual organs. That's the gist of what you said. Yeah, as in it, it could, as in it could in, involve, but it mostly involves things other than the genital organs. Okay, so let me start with the first one. The first question comes from a young man who says that when he was about 15 or 16, he realized that he really liked to wear women's underwear. Now, that on its own is not an unusual fetish, but he says that when he started to wear it, it took him a few years to kind of get past that initial hesitation or the fear that somebody might find out, etc. But when he got to the point where he gave himself the permission to actually wear the women's underwear, he realized that he only likes to have sex with transgenders. So he says, I am not gay. I still like women. But the actual sexual act he only enjoys with transgender. So it was actually his fetish that brought him to this realization. And now he's actually worrying whether 
he has done something bad or wrong, or is this something that he shouldn't be doing? Now, what would you like to say to this young man? So what I would like to say to this young man is that his fetish for women's underwear is completely normal. It is his relationship. Basically, his fetish is a relationship with his sexual enjoyment. And he thinks wearing a woman's underwear gives him more sexual pleasure than not. And it doesn't matter who he was having sex with. It could be with a man, woman or transgender. His fetish would still be normal. But what I do agree with you in some ways, what you were saying is that allowing himself like it, uh, to wear women's underwear, it broke inhibitions. You know, he broke some barriers there and maybe he gave himself permission to try or experiment with something and found his sexual preference to it. You know, he found he'd realized that what he actually enjoys is also having sex with transgender people. So I just want to distinguish that fetish his fetish is women's underwear but his sexual preference is to have sex with transgender community and of course the idea of having sex with the transgender community is also not individual to him because i think that there is also um, you were mentioning a big movement at the moment where a lot of people are saying that that is actually their sexual preference way beyond um, men or women it's sort of it's um, something that's really come into itself right now? Yeah, actually, somebody asked me this interesting question when I was teaching and they asked, because we tried to separate gender from sexual orientation. And they said, what if somebody's preference is to have sex with a person who identifies as a trans person, as a transgender person? And obviously, that would be another preference you know it is different from being heterosexual or gay it would be wanting to have sex with somebody who's transitioned or in transition or a lot of times we also see people enjoy sex by cross-dressing like that's a big fetish and it can or it can not like you know sometimes people confuse it and say oh they must be interested in transitioning or it might be that they want to actually have a sex change but actually what we've seen is people enjoy cross-dressing as a fetish like that gives them sexual pleasure and it might or might not really be related to their gender identity. Okay, great. Thank you, Anvita. I'm hoping that this will really help this young man who, um, just to help him to understand that he is absolutely okay in the way that he's thinking and the way that he's feeling, because the last paragraph of his email was extremely worried about whether he was okay and whether he was doing the right thing. So as Anvita says, this is completely normal and okay in every way. So Anvita, next question. Little bit following on from the first one. It comes from a, a, a man who is in his 30s now. He says that when he was much younger, he took to masturbating in a woman's handkerchief because he um, didn't have a female partner. And so this was his way of coming to orgasm. The only problem is now the idea of ejaculating into a woman's handkerchief has become a fetish. And even though he's with a woman now, he cannot bring himself to come to orgasm within her, even if they have penetrative sex. At the last minute, he has to pull out and actually orgasm into a woman's handkerchief. And he's extremely worried because he feels that it's actually starting to break down his relationship. Yeah, so this is, like you said, it's very complex. And I think I would have taken or done more exploration work if someone was in our clinic. But let's just take it on the face value of what you're saying and uh, that, you know, it is impacting their relationship and he wants to change it. So I'm working from the premise that he wants to change the fetish and he wants to have a better relationship, sexual relationship with his partner. Um, and so one of the suggestions that I can make is that maybe they can introduce the women's handkerchief as part of their foreplay, you know. So it still gives him the arousal. He st it still gives him the excitement. He, you know, he still, you know, gets extra excited seeing that, uh, but that he doesn't need to actually ejaculate in it. Or there might be a transition period. So, you know, it starts with initially that he keeps it on his side and then ejaculates and slowly and steadily, it might be like keeping it by his side, looking at it, 
or then introducing it as a foreplay or playing with it or having it on the woman's body. So there are transitions or the ways that he can include it with his partner, which still gives him the sexual pleasure he gets from the handkerchief. But at the same time, if they as a couple want to experience you know, penetrative intercourse, then they can have that without him needing to ejaculate in the handkerchief. You know what? I think that's really helpful. That is seriously useful. And if you're listening to us on this vlog today, I hope that you'll follow on with our suggestion because I think that there's real hope in being able to transition away from the women's handkerchief if that's what you really wish to do, as you've mentioned to us. Okay, great. Let's get a little bit more complex now. My next question is from actually from a couple who indulge in this particular um, fetish. And this is about playing with scat and urine. But I bring this up because one is, of course, the couple who wrote to us said that, you know, they, again, they wanted to know if there was something wrong with what they're doing, because, of course, scat or feces, um, for those of our listeners who don't know what scat is, um, your feces, your urine, it's not a very nice, um, pleasant sort of object to be playing with. So, uh, you know, I can understand that they're writing in to say, are they doing something wrong? Are they doing something bad? But since then, I've also had a few emails from people saying, my partner wants to do this and I find it awful. What do you have to say about this particular fetish? So yeah, Seema, like I know that most people who are listening might think that is absolutely weird. Why would somebody get sexual arousal from, you know, feces or urinating or scat or poo. But it is a fetish that exists and it is a fetish that is, uh, that you would hear from multiple people that they have their fetish. And what's important to think about it, so from both perspectives, from the individual's perspective, once again, who are we to judge? That's what gives them sexual arousal. And that, you know, gets them the excitement. They get, feel excited when feces are involved or scat is involved in lovemaking. And if that's what works for them, I'm not, we don't need to judge it. That's their relationship. And if they find a partner who gets as excited by scat or, you know, urinating, then you know, that's wonderful that they found somebody who gets as excited and that would make a really good, amazing sexual experience. However, as you mentioned, that for other people, it might sound like that's disgusting, that's weird, how could somebody like something like that? So it can be very difficult for individuals to actually verbalize their fetish to a partner, you know, to introduce it and say, oh, actually, you know what, this is what I'm interested in, you know. So can you imagine that conversation and how fearful they might be that it's going to get rejected? Like they would just always assume that it would get rejected. So one of the suggestions that I would make is that if you have the fears of rejection, then maybe present it as an idea presented as what do you think if somebody was interested in this, how would you react? If your partner has a very opposed reaction or they're not interested at all, maybe try suggesting having it visually on a video or, you know, just as a picture behind you, just like we think of other ways that we can introduce it so that you can get some excitement out of it. There is, your partner doesn't have to feel as inhibited or disgusted by it. So if there is a happy medium that the both of you can find. And, you know, I know that we're going to discuss later on about partners as well, because I can understand that for a partner, if they're not interested in it, it's a tall ask. You know, it's a tall ask to say, let's have sex and I want to you know, play with your urine. Now, that is a tall ask. So that can be difficult. And I would, you know, it might require you to get some help to negotiate this space with your partner. Yeah, because this is one of those uh, fetishes that a lot of people have written in about 
about their partner's reaction. So I've had uh, men writing in saying, oh, you know, my wife always looks at me and says, are you mad each time I suggest it? And uh, I, we've even had a couple of young women write in and say that this is what my partner wants me to do. And I just find it so unacceptable. I think it, it's a particularly difficult one to deal with because I was just thinking, I mean, um, and with a, like you said, yes, if it is a fetish that you have, that's fine. And if you find a partner who is into it equally, that's brilliant because you know, you can't, you can't get better than that, frankly, if both of you want the same things and you're sexually compatible, that's fantastic. But I was just thinking like even the basic stench of it or, you know, the smell, it, it is kind of difficult, I think, for partners to come to that acceptance. You know, when one of the people had written in and said uh, that her partner wants her to actually um, urinate on the floor in front of him. Now, you can imagine you're in your bedroom and he wants you to sit down on the floor in front of him and then urinate. And it, it is a difficult one to do. So... I know, and it sounds, I'm sure people who are listening, they are thinking, oh, that's bizarre. But once again, it's a fetish. It happens. People get aroused by it. They get excited. But as soon as we start thinking of another person in this relationship, and it goes beyond your relationship with your fetish, it does get complex, you know. And we say this week after week. If as a partner, you're not interested in it, don't go along with it for, for the sake of it. It takes away from your sexual pleasure. You know, if you're feeling uncomfortable about something or disgusted by something, you're not going to enjoy lovemaking. And that's not the point that your partner is asking you to do. So communicate, talk about it. You know, and sometimes, you know, couples will come in where they have to face the tough question, where is the fetish more important or the partner? You know, they have to figure it out and they really come up with creative solutions where the partner might say, okay, you can go enjoy your fetish somewhere else or, you know, I will do this much but not more. I'm okay with like, like seeing a picture of it but I'm not actually going to physically do it. So they really negotiate the space and we also try and understand what pleasure or what emotion is this fetish fulfilling for the partner? And can we replicate it through something else? Will something else satisfy it? So it is a really interesting space to, you know, really maneuver and negotiate and understand. But don't give up the communication. You know, it's not your partner is not bad for having a fetish and you're not bad for liking the same fetish. So communicate and try and find a way out rather than, you know, judging your partner or feeling forced that you need to like partake in this. I think that's really amazing. I mean, it keeps bringing me back to this idea of the fact that, you know, we don't talk about sex and sexuality. It is so taboo, even, or, you know, just the most average kind of missionary position between a married couple kind of sex, even that is not spoken about. And this is just that much deeper and nobody's going to talk to you. And you can almost imagine somebody going out into the big bad world and saying, this is what I like. You can imagine the sort of reactions that they're going to get face on. So, you know, it must be so difficult to understand that this is what you have to do. And you know, just keeping that trust between a couple to say that, okay, we are going to talk, we're going to have this conversation, no matter what happens, we're going to discuss it. And we're going to try and see if we have a way out. So for this particular person, and for everybody else who has written in on the idea of scat or urine, understand that this is not the end of the world if your partner doesn't want it. Like Anvita says, try it with just visualizing it. I have pictures, have photos, have other objects nearby that remind you of that and see if that works and keep talking it through. Anvita, are you ready for the next one? Absolutely. Okay, so um, the next one that I want to bring out is this idea of people in positions of authority. Now, to me, I think that that's, again, a very, very ordinary, average, common 
um, fetish. It's, you know, this idea of having somebody who's in power, somebody who's important. Um, it, you know, people have this thing about uh, somebody in uniform. That's a pretty common fantasy and a fetish, isn't it? Um, or, you know, the sex with your boss because he's more powerful and so on. So this is quite... Um, it's quite a commonplace one, but I have recently had a couple of people writing in and talking about wanting to introduce their mother-in-law into the relationship. Now, I'm just wondering, does this in your mind also come under this idea of positions of power or positions yeah. of authority? You know, so the first time we discussed this question, it was, it, and it, as in, I'm sure for the listeners listening, they're thinking, whoa, like, you know, that's really what's going on here. It's crossing boundaries. But I think if we come down, I think all the relationships here, what we need to focus is on it's the relationship. So the mother-in-law might be somebody in a position of authority. There is a certain amount of, you know, um, there might be some image of what she is, how she is, how she behaves, and it might trigger something in that person, you know. So what we need to do is we need to focus on the relationship and not so much. Like if you think about it, people have the fetish of, having sex with policemen or having sex with teachers. You don't actually bring the teacher or policeman into your bedroom. What you might do is you might do role plays. You might dress up as a police officer or as a teacher or something like that. So once again here, I think what's important for this person is that you're obviously not going to bring your mother-in-law into the bedroom. So what is the relationship that you're seeking? What is that is exciting in that relationship? Is that that she's very authoritative? Is it because she is a shouter? What, you know, what is it? Does she use harsh language, harsh word? What is the trigger or what is exciting about that relationship? Or is there something that she does that, you know, feels exciting? And once you figure out that, you can obviously role play it with your partner. You can, you know, if you like harsh language, you can role play that harsh language. If you like the shouting, you can role play the shouting. If you like the gentleness, you can role play the gentleness. But it's more about the relationship and less about who there is. You know, I absolutely love what you have said through this whole thing, because I think we, we generally tend to deal with fetishes. Like I said, you know, we always think of them as this slightly underground word, slightly um, negative connotation, oh, ha, ha, you know, that kind of thing. And you just realize how much, um, it, how much of yourself goes into a fetish, how much of your mind, your brain is involved in that. And that you really need to have a better relationship with your own sexuality, with your own brain, and talk out some of these things, even if it's to yourself, if not to somebody outside, just so that you can understand it in terms of the wider relationship, you know, with, with your partner or with society or with yourself. Yeah, you know, what you're saying is very important because... Um when I was preparing for this video, one of the things that we learned is that fetishes sometimes make you feel a certain way. So for example, an example I was given was that cross-dressing makes somebody feels less anxious or calm like that. And then when they're feeling less anxious and they're feeling calm, obviously love making feel that much exciting and more pleasurable. And they have to find that relationship that you know and then it became okay the for the partner the dressing like full woman was too much but could they have a piece of clothing that they could bring in which still made them feel less anxious and calm and the partner could live with the fact that you know there was a piece of clothing that her partner was wearing and it was you know she could bear with that as well and they could have an amazing relationship but they had to feel through what was important for each person and what were they willing to overcome and what were they willing to accept. Um, so you're absolutely right that fetishes don't always need to be about sex. They can be, but they could be, you know, something psychological, emotional about them as well. And what, it's worth exploring your own mind to figure out what that is. 
Okay, BDSM. Yeah, I was waiting for that one to come in. <laughs> and I, it's been... the most common one, but I, I have a reason for having left it to the end. But please tell us, what do you think about BDSM? I was waiting for that one because, you know, it seems like people see it as a fetish. And for me, I think when we, when we say BDSM is a, is a fetish, you're really minimizing the community. It's a very large community. And it is now a community where people are saying that's where we need to go and learn about consent and contracts, you know. It's no, if when we go to, there's so many contracts and there's so much consent that is taken before somebody actually engages in sex. Um, okay, let's do this. Yeah. I was just waiting for that one to come because I think, you know, people always think about BDSM and they think about it as a fetish. But I think about it as a community. It's a sexual preference. And it is a community where now more and more people are saying that that's the community where we need to go and learn about consent. You would be Oh, that's interesting. How, yeah. Because there are so many rules and regulations in that, you know, in that relationship where there is a contract before you actually negotiate what is allowed, what is not allowed, what are the signs for stopping. And once the person says stop, there is no like, oh, I didn't get that. I didn't understand. It's very clear. When that sign, and if the sign could be putting your hand up, could be anything, and when that signal is given, the other person stops. There is no like, oh, I didn't realize. None of that is there. And the biggest myth that I want to break is that people think people who are aggressive or violent within sex, that's BDSM. And that is absolutely not what BDSM is. You have to understand that there's a combination there. There is one partner who might be the submissive partner or, you know, that's one of the relationships that I'm talking about who like receiving pain and they meet up with a partner who like, they might be the dominance partner, the dominant partner who like inflicting pain. And that's the combination that meets and sex is very pleasurable for them because one likes receiving, one likes inflicting. And so it's not like, oh, I like hitting somebody while I'm having sex and that's BDSM. Does your partner like receiving sex? Do they feel aroused when sex is being, uh, when, um, when, you know, pain is being inflicted on it? If not, then that's not BDSM. That's not the other partner giving permission. And I really want to break this myth because now with like social media and Netflix and everything, people just believe that having violent sex is just one kind and, of sex. And Fifty Shades of Grey. And Fifty Shades of Grey is not BDSM. The BDSM community would be very horrified considering, you know, because once again, there is a power differential in Fifty Shades of Grey. He is in the position of power and she is not somebody who's okay with that. You know, she's not somebody who gets aroused by that. Um, so it's really important that we find that combination, you know, when we're thinking, like we said before, if your partner doesn't like your fetish, then they are not going to feel aroused. They're not going to feel the pleasure. Sex is not going to be enjoyable for them. So just because it's your fetish doesn't mean it needs to be your partner's fetish. Um, so, yeah. That's a, that's a really um, important, uh, you know, so what I'm taking away from that, and I, I'm fascinated that, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, we know that within the BDSM community, consent is so important. I mean, they have the safe words, they have the safe gestures. There, is, there are all these rules to it. And uh, it, people are so careful to stay within those rules. You know, when we attend workshops, for instance, there are people who run workshops for BDSM. And, uh, you know, it's very, very important, you know, where they would stop you constantly because I attended a workshop on that, you know, as part of my research. And it was fascinating because, you know, they, the person, like the person holding the workshop would say, okay, now the dominant partner must spank the submissive partner on the bottom with this particular leather strap or whatever. 
But as soon as you do it, you hit once and then you rub it better. So you have to make them feel comforted with it as well. So, you know, there was just so much, there were so many rules. And I like what you said, that there is a whole sense of consent around this, that, you know, the, both people are saying, yes, we want to do it. So for everybody out there listening in and thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we're so into BDSM. And is it, we are not saying whether it is right or wrong. We are saying that there are ways of doing it. It is there are a whole set of rules around it. It's like if you get into a wrestling ring or a boxing ring, there are rules around your boxing, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sport. Similarly, for BDSM, there are a lot of rules and you can't just sort of, you know, go trigger happy and say, well, you know, I'm going to start beating the other person up and this is all very exciting for me. It may not be for the other person. Yeah, and you know, and when you were talking about it, you know, there is even contract of what is permissible. It's not only like how, what all can you do, what can happen, everything is, they have first discussed it before, before they engage in it, you know, how much is pleasurable, how much is not. And on the other flip side also, I think the social media also presents this, that just because there's a person who's the dominant person who likes inflicted pain, or oh, they are the villain. You know, they are the villain who are just devils. And even in their sex making, making they like to hit people. That, that's not true either. You know, once again, it's about the combination. You know, they're not going and hitting everybody. So if they have a partner who's not into BDSM, they're not going and hitting them. Unless there is consent and a contract, they will not engage in the same lovemaking with somebody who's not part of the BDSM community. They will be very respectful of that fact. So I think that from this particular question, what I really want everybody to understand and take away, because again, a lot of questions came in about BDSM from a lot of people who are fairly young, who just are getting excited by the idea. And I think it's more like a novelty thing that it isn't just a, okay, let's go out and do this. Please take very careful note of what Anvita has said. There are a huge number of rules, and the most important thing over here is consent. Now, Anvita, I understand. Yeah, one when thing we... I just want to add, sorry, I'm just saying, because I know we might move forward from BDSM. If you do want to be, engage in BDSM, and you do think that that's what is exciting for you, and that's the community you want to join, there are lots of resources online. There are lots of classes, like you said. There are lots of groups. Uh, there are lots of people who show you how it's done and what it is. So do educate yourself and learn about it before, even, you know, sometimes because people uh, can uh, be, you know, they, they think they're entering a BDSM relationship and they can get hurt in the process. So go educate yourself, go learn about it. Uh, and then, you know, there'll be many more opportunities for you to experiment. I was actually um, going to come to the point that I had um, an email literally yesterday from a young girl who wrote in and said that her part, so she's got engaged earlier this year. And obviously with the lockdown, she's due to be married later this year, but with the lockdown, she hasn't had a chance to spend personal time with her fiance. It's all been, you know, over phones and so on and so forth, like most of the world has. And she was saying that she, her partner, who otherwise is fantastic in every way, has this thing about, he said, you know, he's, she said that he has all these fetishes about like, he wants her to um, get injections in her bottom and wants to watch her getting this. And various other things that he comes up and he tells her, where most of them end up with her getting hurt or her being, um, having some kind of pain inflicted on her. Now, the reason I bring this up is because here is a young girl. She says that she's still a virgin, that she comes from a very conservative small town. She's never even masturbated in all her life. And there is this one person who is now going to be her husband, who's now expecting all this of her. And she's petrified. She's so nervous because she says, she said in her email, she said, you know, I keep getting nervous. I don't know what to say. I tell him, but this will be painful. And he says to her, 
well, if there's no pain, there won't be enough pleasure. Now, she's obviously not in a mental space to understand that. So she's getting even more frightened. And then he'll just laugh at the end and say, look, just because we dream about something, we don't have to go through with it. Now, this is a young girl who at the normal time of life wouldn't even, I mean, this would even just having average missionary position sex would have been a huge thing for her, a huge step forward. Somebody who's still a virgin, somebody who's never even masturbated. This is really, really out of the box. Is there something that we can say to her to reassure her? What I want to say is that this fiance has a lot of balls presenting it to her because, you know, there's no fear that she might get spooked because like you're saying, that it is quite a scary Unfortunately, I mean, without, I don't know either the fiance or the girl, but I think unfortunately that's, generally a way that um, it's generally the way of society in smaller towns in India. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't even imagine a girl standing up, a young girl standing up to him and saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to marry you. It's, it's hardly likely to happen. So yeah, you know, no, he does I have actually, the upper hand. He does. But what I'm saying is that, you know, like we said, we were coming from a very empathetic standpoint of people who have fetishes because they can be tricky and they can feel judged by other people. I'm just saying this person must be very secure in their sexual identity to present this idea but because I'm sure for this young girl, she must be wondering, oh my God, is this a freak? Is this sex? Like, does sex actually is like that? If she's never masturbated, if she doesn't have a relationship with what she enjoys sexually, she must be, you know, it is a very impressionable point, right? Like she could be thinking, oh, that's what sex is. And that's what she's going to stay with, that sex equals pain. And that's not true. Sex doesn't equal pain. Sex equals pleasure. Or sex should equal pleasure. And so what I would really say to her is, if you're not enjoying what gives him pleasure, don't do it. As in, or find a way to speak to him and say, look, this is not, you know, this is making me feel scared. This actually induces feelings of fear. And, you know, I, I'm not enjoying this. And don't make him a bad person. Just because he has a fetish doesn't make him a bad person. So not for once am I saying that he's somebody bad. But obviously, you need to build a relationship first. There has to be trust. There has to be intimacy. There has to be a chemistry. And then automatically, maybe you would want to do something for him. Or you might want to live up to one of his you know, fetishes or fantasies. But if right now it feels too much then say to him very openly that I understand that that's your fetish, but it feels too much for me. Can I get some time? You know, can we speak about this in some time? And buy yourself time rather than giving in to it. And also maybe they could actually introduce it, like you said, for somebody else's idea, that they could introduce it um, as a fantasy into their role play or in, into their foreplay. So rather than actually doing it, sort of fantasize about it, talk about it, um, build it up in the mind as opposed to in the body. Yeah, as in because absolutely, like there are, we've spoken about fantasies, if, if that's something that gives him pleasure, maybe he can express it, he can verbalize it, and that can give him arousal. And, you know, I don't know if they're meeting right now or not, we spoke about the phone sex video where it's all about fantasies and things. Um, so it's all right to say to him, go gentle on this. It's too much for me. If she feels that it's too much for her, there's nothing wrong in saying it's not. This is a fetish for him. You can go gentle and say it's too much for me right now. At the and also, as Anvita said earlier, that there are a lot of online um, sites you can go to to find out a little bit more about um, sexual acts or fantasies or fetishes where there is some kind of pain involved or some kind of BDSM. So go on there and try and watch it, listen to it so that maybe it might allay some of your fears. 
if she wants to, like I would really go back. See, I know what you're saying that she might not have a choice and she might be very stuck to go along. Uh, but I always get worried that if it doesn't come, if that is, if you're not open to experimenting or if that's not something that's excites you, the relationship between sex and your pleasure gets really impacted by that. So I would, I would really encourage and say do what gives you pleasure um, and you know, communicate with your partner rather than just go along. That's really good advice, actually. And I'm now going to tell you about another partner, but from a very different point of view. So this is actually a young man who wrote to me. And he said that his partner, who he has great sex with normally, has now come to him and said that she wants a facial finish. Now, for those of our viewers who are listening in and may not know what that means, it means where the man pulls out of the woman during the orgasm part and actually ejaculates on her face. Now, this is the girl has asked for it. And he's written in, he's very upset because he says, this is really wrong. I think it's demeaning to women. And I don't think that she understands what she's saying. I think that she's just heard it somewhere on you know, on social media and she wants to try it and it's not right. And how do I persuade her that it's not right? Now, I found this email rather interesting because, you know, there is, there's a little bit of both. I mean, there is this guy trying to be really nice and thinking about the fact that, okay, he doesn't want to be demeaning to women and that's wonderful in its own way. However, I also think that if this young girl has asked for something, I mean, she also, like we've said, that it takes a lot of courage to talk about your fantasies, your fetishes, the things that you might want to do, which are not the average everyday things, but slightly out of the box. It must have taken her a lot of guts to actually say that she wants this. And she's now being told that she doesn't know what she wants and that she's wrong in asking for it. And that she's merely following the crowd and doesn't really understand what her own mind is. Yeah, it does sound a bit patronizing. I will agree with that. And I think it's very similar to the previous message in some ways, to the effect of that's her fetish, you know, that's what gives her arousal. So just that we said for the previous guy, doesn't make her a bad person, doesn't make her that, you know, she's derogatory, like she doesn't know what she wants or anything. This is a woman who's saying a facial finish arouses me. It gives me sexual pleasure. I like it. I enjoy it. Now, as a partner, you can say, I don't enjoy it. It takes away my sexual pleasure. I don't like doing this to you, so I don't want to engage with it. But I don't think as a partner, you have the right to judge the other partner's fetish, you know, to say, oh, that fetish is derogatory, that fetish is yucky, that's not an okay fetish. That becomes problematic because then in some ways you're judging your partner's fetish. You don't like it, you don't enjoy it, don't partake in it. You know, just the way we said for the other young woman, don't, if you don't want to, don't do it. And so the same thing for this man, you don't like it, it takes away from your sexual pleasure. Say to her, doesn't do it for me, I would like to not you know, partake in it. But don't say to her, you don't know what you like. Because I think if she's come to this point to say she likes a facial finish, she definitely knows what she likes, you know. Um, so I don't think- Or even if it's something that she just much. wants to try out. Absolutely. Like if she wants to experiment with it, she might like it, she might not like it. Or, you know, but at least this, she's definitely not someone who she has the courage and she has the spirit to explore her sexuality. She wants to try different things. And this is one of the things, like if she's made the suggestion or request, it means that she's fantasized about it. She's thought about it and it has excited her. You know, so I don't, I definitely feel that we shouldn't judge it. Uh, we have the full right to refuse to partake in it, but I don't think we should judge a fetish. I think that's really um, um, 
sensible advice, actually. And for this young man, I would particularly like to point out that, um, you know, th this whole idea of saying that it is demeaning to women, uh, I totally appreciate your sentiment around it. But, you know, it, it, it may not be such a bad thing to try something that your partner wants to do, which is not really hurting anybody in too many ways. So I, I think that it might be worth sort of also sometimes opening our, up our mind to um, certain other things for the pleasure of the partner. And, you know, like I said before, that is a whole, you know, it sounds like a small, like, oh, we can just do it for our partner. But I think it's not actually such a small space. It's a really huge space because there is so right. much around our choices, do we like it, do we not like it? We say yes to one thing, but then when it comes to something else, we're like, oh, that's too yucky. So I just think that it is a very big area and the combination with the partner. Uh, I think it is a tricky one. I think it does take loads of couple into therapy rooms to really try and really unpick and fi uh, figure it out. And Absolutely, sometimes it yeah. also leads to some couples never, ever talking about their fetishes because they're really scared that their partners would reject it. So it happens both ways. And I would, you know, it is a tricky space. Absolutely. So I'm actually going to give you my very last one now because it actually follows on very, very um, well from the previous one. And as you said, it's all very well for us to sit here and say, well, look, you know, if she's suggested it, you should try it. Even if it's something that you feel so strongly about, you feel that it's demeaning, etc. cetera. Um, if your partner really wants it, it might be worth trying. But sometimes we understand that certain things can be really difficult. Now, there was a man who wrote to me who said that they are in their 40s, he and his wife. They have a um, very good relationship with each other, but that the sex is starting to become a little bit boring. And he said that what he finds is that um, what really arouses him is rough language or bad language or really abusive language. He says, however, that his wife absolutely refuses to do this. She can't do this. Now, just to put it into context, this is a South Indian couple. And the woman wrote in and said that she come, they, they're such a conservative family that when she speaks to her husband in public, she does not even raise her eyes to look at him in the eyes. I mean, she actually has her head lowered when she speaks to him in public. But he thinks that when they go into the bedroom, she can just drop all of this and start speaking to him in abusive, coarse language? So for me, it, like, it has lots of ideas floating through because one, I feel like sometimes our public persona might or might not match our sexual persona. So we might be different people in bed than we are in public. But at the same time, I also do think that there are you know, how much you can push yourself is individual to every person. And also, who do you believe you're as a person? So as a woman, if she has ideas of what is right, what is wrong, what are sensibilities that should be followed, uh, what is culture-wise not acceptable or acceptable, now those are her values. So maybe you can introduce it as an idea and say, let's role play. So you're playing the role of an ex person where she can give herself permission to use that language. Because otherwise I can imagine that it's too far away from who she is to suddenly behave like that. Like, and that can feel too much for her. And, you know, once again, when she starts partaking in that are you taking away from her sexual pleasure like in the moment is she feeling like oh I don't like this I'm not a nice person for talking like this I'm like you know not a respectable woman talking like this or whatever like I don't want to get into respect or no respect but for her it might not be pleasurable so one of the ideas would be to do role play to say she is pretend this person and in that persona in that role she might give herself permission to talk a certain way i want to um, also say that you know 
Um, sorry to interrupt, but I was just thinking that a lot of times it's about opening a door. And sometimes we might say, oh, you know, it's great to be able to do this. And if you could do, but it's like the very first fetish that we dealt with, where this, this young boy said that he started to give himself the permission when he didn't feel guilty about wearing women's underwear anymore. He gave himself the permission to wear it. And then suddenly it opened up his mind to the fact that he likes to have sex with transgenders, which was something that he only came to after he gave himself permission to follow his fetish. Now, it could be that this young woman, the wife, gives herself permission to do this. But what are the changes that it brings in you subsequently? Because that can also happen. And a lot of times, I think partners don't think about that necessarily. And I think this is also something I would like people to take away from this video is that when you do all of this, it's wonderful if both partners can be on the same page when it comes to a certain sexual act or a desire or a fetish. It's fantastic because it leads to really pleasurable, joyous intimacy. But you have to be prepared for all the things that come with it because when you make a change, then changes will come. Yeah, I, and I think it's especially difficult for women. It's the whole madonna versus whore thing that we talk about where women are supposed to be you know they are supposed to behave and act a certain way and then people just expect them to change or you know flip when they come into the bedroom and that is a difficult ask you know it's not easy you can't just ask people to shift and once again um, you know, it, it, and if you're going to ask for the change, like you're saying, then it's not necessary the change will be limited to the bedroom, then it might go out. And are you prepared for that? Um, and is it okay? Yeah, I think that um, this is a subject that we could probably go on talking about for a very long time because um, it is so much a part of the human psyche. But I think that... Um, it's time to bring it all to a close. Once again, just to reiterate a lot of Anvita's advice that a fetish is not an underground negative bad thing. It's very much a part of your mind. It's how you think. But if you do have a situation where either your partner is not okay with it or it is impacting your life in some um, perceivable way, then it is time to understand how to renegotiate the way that you act out your fetish. Keep your communication corridors open with your partner at all times. The more you build up a trust between yourselves, the better things will be at any given time, even more so for this. And that at some point, you have to understand that if you both don't share the same ideas, the same desires or the same fetishes, you have to understand that it has to be negotiated. It isn't something that you can go ahead and just put on the other person. You have to make sure that you negotiate it, that you get their consent and so on. And with all of that in motion, we hope that this leads to a wonderfully productive, healthy sexual life for all time to come. As always on the video, please do like, subscribe, and comment. If you have any questions, the email is info.seema.anand at gmail.com. And if you need to consult Anvita, please email her directly on anvitamadanbehel.com. We'll see you here next week. See you next week.